Okay, so God bless you, everybody. I'm just welcoming you to this session on dementia, Alzheimer's, and the church. Thank you for taking the time out to be here today and for choosing to be in this session. And co-presenting with Sister Sandra, she'll introduce herself when the time comes for her part of the presentation. But just want to, of course, acknowledge the presence of God and our leaders, and in particular, I want to say thanks to our Bishop Landell, Bishop Designate Landell, for having the insight to, to request for us to have this talk on this topic. It is becoming a topic that is of increasingly importance. Uh, I was listening to a commentary recently and a study was done in America not too long ago about what adults are mostly afraid of in terms of diseases. And it turned out that it is now the D word that people are whispering. Previously, it was the C word, i.e. cancer, that people didn't want to talk about. But now people are afraid of dementia. And it is something that um, we tend to be less willing to talk about, especially in our, in our ethnic group, as, as it were. So today, I, I just want to... Um, give, you know, acknowledgement for the opportunity to talk on this. The scripture that we, we got was um, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, which is a well-known scripture for us, which talks about the fact that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. And fear is a, can be a good thing. It's an emotion that can protect us. If you're being chased by a tiger, it, 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 um, evokes the emotion of fear and you run away, you, you know, but the spirit of fear is something different. And that is very prevalent in our society. And one of the reasons why we tend to be fearful, why the spirit of fear might be overtaking us is because of lack of knowledge. If we don't have knowledge on certain things, we become fearful of it. If I don't know what's gonna happen with COVID, if I don't know what the economy is gonna do, I am, more likely to be fearful. But if I understand exactly what is happening, even though it might be a challenging circumstances, I'm more prepared, I'm less likely to be fearful. And so this is what we're hoping that this session will do, will provide power so that we can be more capable and in a better frame of mind, less fearful to, to deal with this. Just to say that to Alzheimer's Society in, in 2019, a session that they did, Ensha represents one in 14 of the population over 65. So one in 14 of people ages over 65 will have dementia. And this is increasing. And by the year 2040, say in another 20, 22 years, it is expected that that will increase, will double. So it is a growing concern and uh, hence the reason why it is important for us to be talking about it. So just going back. So in terms of a definition, we, we ban the, the, the terminologies about dementia, Alzheimer's, and I'm so sorry that we don't have a face-to-face -face um, you know, session at today. I'd be asking you, what's your understanding? And, whether dementia, in your view, and Alzheimer's are one of the same things, because they are used interchangeably, but actually it shouldn't be. Dementia is an umbrella term. If you think of fruits, for example, dementia would be fruits, and underneath you'll have the oranges and the pears and the mangoes and all of the other fruits. So dementia is an umbrella term. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia, but it is the most common type of dementia. So just to make that clarity. Now, when we talk about dementia, it is the name given to a progressive, irreversible group of clinical signs and symptoms with cognitive and behavior changes. So there has to be cognitive changes. Cognitive function refers to our higher intellectual function, our ability to think, our ability to reason, our ability to remember things. That's our cognitive function. With dementia, that declines. It also affects our behavior because of all the things that are happening to us. And some of the things that we'll see manifested as a result of this is 
memory loss, that tends to be one of the early signs, in particular, recent memory loss, um, memory loss for recent events. That's what I mean by that. We get problems with reasoning and communication, change in personality and reduction in the person's ability to carry out daily activities. That's a key thing. If somebody is a little bit um, forgetful, but they're able to get on with their day-to-day -day lives, then perhaps it isn't dementia. So some of the key words, key terminologies, like I said, it's progressive. Unfortunately, dementia gets worse. If somebody has dementia, as the year progresses, it will get worse. It's an irreversible condition as it relates to normal, worldly uh, pathophysiology, it is not something that can be cured. Of course, as children of God, we know we serve a God who is a miracle worker, and that's not impossible for him to cure somebody with dementia. But in terms of how we think of it as, as, as for medicine, natural thinking, it's an irreversible condition. And I use the term syndrome here because it cannot just be one sign. Syndrome in medicine refers to a group of clinical signs and symptoms. So there has to be a group of things. And I mentioned earlier, things like memory loss, which may be the first sign. There has to be reasoning problem, change in personality. So a group of things. It can't just be memory loss. So syndrome, and like I mentioned earlier, it affects both cognitive and behavioral function, and it must be affecting activities of daily living in order for it to be classed as dementia. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this particular slide because it is, I think, maybe the crux of the matter. So I'm going to be looking at the types of dementia. And as I mentioned, Alzheimer's is the most common type. It makes up up to 75%. And you may be able to see here, this, if this were a pie, this represents, this uh, dark purple square represents Alzheimer's disease. This next section would be the vascular dementia, which is about 20%. And then we've got a mixed, because one of the challenges with dementia is the fact that it is not always clear cut one time. In some occasions, dementia can be of a mixed type. It can also be what we call dementia with Lewy bodies and or frontotemporal dementia, and other types of dementia uh, exist because there are other causes, for example, Parkinson's diseases. We'll just look at those a little bit more later. And um, the different types of dementia have different characteristics. And that is the importance of, if at all possible, having the, the, the diagnosis of the type of dementia. It just allows us as doctors, as individuals with the condition, as carers, to better care for the individual with dementia if we know the type. But it is challenging sometimes to make that distinction, to make that dementia, it's not always possible. Now, it is important for us to remember that dementia is a disease of the brain. It is easy for us to think of a disease of the heart, heart failure, for example, but it's less easy to conceptualize dementia. Even as a doctor, when I first, heard uh, about dementia as a cause of death and to write dementia on a death certificate as a cause of death, that bugged my mind because I'm thinking, how did that person die from dementia, why? But it is important for us to remember that our brain controls our entire body function. The brain controls how we move, how we sleep, how we move the, the hormones in our body, the, the regulation of temperatures, everything that we do, the, our heartbeat, our breathing, our ability to swallow, to eat food, all of those are controlled by the, the brain. Everything in our body is controlled by the brain. So if we have brain failure, if we have brain death, then eventually we will die because the amount of tissue that is left of the brain will not be able to sustain life. And that is why people die from dementia. So if you think of the, the brain as we see it, we've got this, um, this diagram here or representation of the brain. I'm going to ask you to put your hands in front of you. Put your hands in front of you with your palms down, turned downwards. 
the top of your hand, the back of your hand, you'll notice is darker than the palms of your hands. That's what the brain looks like. We talk about our gray matter. That's the top of the surface of the brain. That bit is referred to as the cerebrum. It's the cortex that is this, the upper layer, which is darker and gives that gray color. It, it consists of a lot of um, cell bodies. The dark, the, the lighter bit, which is deeper in the brain, refers to the, 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 the axons. So it's the parts of the neurons that transmit information and they are sheeted with what we call myelin sheets. And so that makes it the lighter color. So just so you, you, get, you have an idea of, of, the, of what happens, but that's the surface of the brain, which is also generally uh, divided into four lobes. We'll talk about those in a little, in a little, in a, a little while, but it's important to also be aware that deeper in the structures, deeper underneath these lobes are other important structures. One of which is something that we refer to as the hippocampus. And studies have shown that that's the area where we store our life's memory or our ability to, to the, it's the center of learning and memory. It's a very, very important part of the brain. And unfortunately, that's one of the area that goes quite quickly, especially with Alzheimer's disease. So people struggle to mem memorize things and, to, and in particular to lay down new memory. So all the old stuff will be there at the, at the initial onset, but the new things, somebody with dementia can't lay down, they can't lay down those memories because that part of the brain is dying. There is, it's like a drawer without a bottom. You put the memory in there, you just had your lunch, you put it in there, and somebody asks you 10 minutes later, what did you have for lunch? You haven't got a clue. You come up to your carer, somebody, you know, your relative, your daughter, your son, and, and said to them, what time are we going to do whatever, X, Y, Z? And you tell me it's two o'clock. 10 minutes time, I come and I ask you the same question because I don't remember. I can't store that function. And that's one of the key things that we see happening. So if you were to make a fist with your hands, put your, two, your, your fist together so, and put, make it something looking like this. And if you were to put the back of your hands together, it would represent the two lobes of the brain because the lobes, the brain is, is divided into left and right lobes. The area where your, your, the back of your hands are meeting is that part of the brain that allows transmission between both lobes, it's called the corpus callosum. And that part of, at your wrist where both arms are crossing, you could refer to that as the brain stem. I don't know if you can see it here. And that is the area that controls our breathing, our heart rate, our ability to swallow, our sleeping, a very important part of the brain. And if you were to put your, your, your arms together, it would represent the spinal cord. So just to give you a sort of, you know, practical uh, illustration of what the brain is like. But if we go now to look at the lobes, if you put your hand to the front of your head, your forehead area over there, that's the frontal lobe of the brain. That's a very important part of the brain. It's the most developed. It's referred to as the, you could call it the boss of the brain. It's the area that controls executive functioning. It's the area that makes you who you are, is responsible for your personality. It's responsible for, for emotions. It's the ability to think and make these decisions. That's the part of the brain that does it. It's that part of the brain that makes you think before you speak rather than just do something and perform higher executive functions. That's the frontal lobe. If you put your hand at the top of your head, then you'll be putting your hands over the parietal lobe. And that lobe of the brain is very important because it controls sensory input. Our brain is such that it has sensation, sensory input going into it and motor input coming out. So senses or five senses, how we interact with the world is what guides how we go along from day to day. We're walking around, it's the senses that are telling us how we are in space. And we refer to that as proprioception. That's, what, that's where that is. It's the thing that makes us be able to appreciate and um, taste and feel. So sensations around our mouth, 
and there is like a map of the brain in that parietal area as it relates to sensory input. And it is worth noting that some areas of our body has greater sensory input than other areas. For example, our mouth, our tongue, that area is the most sensitive part of our body. So we have a bigger part of the brain dedicated to that versus our back or hands. The next area that has a lot of sensory input dedicated to it is our hands, our feet, and the genital areas. So if you think of somebody with dementia, they a lot of things that we that needs to be done to such individuals or done with such individuals involve those areas. So somebody with dementia might bruise themselves, for example, on their back, on their arm, and they, well, the back you can't, you may not be able to see, but even on their arm, they might not notice it. And you might say, mom, dad, have you not noticed you bruised yourself there, you cut, what happened? They're not aware. But at the same time, you're trying to give them their medication and they're screaming. You're trying to assess them, assist them with their hygienic needs. And it's very uncomfortable and it's as if you're murdering them. They're not being unkind. They're not being punitive. They're not being commuting, as, as Dr. Uh, Minister Codner said last night. Um, it's just that their brain is dying. The functions are dying and the areas where the more sensitive uh, sensory inputs go to are more sensitive, but the other areas are not responding in the same way. So that's the parietal area. The sides of our brain represent what we call the temporal lobe, if you should put your hands there. And that's the area of the brain that, is, that has to do with memory, how we store the memory. I talk about the hippocampus, which is lower down in there. It is the area that deals with language. And language in particular is a very important thing in dementia. It's how people are able to communicate. We communicate with spoken words and with written words. And with language, it lateralizes which side of the brain tends to deal with certain parts of language. So the left side of the brain apparently deals with the higher language function. So to find words, to have a deep, meaningful conversation, it would be the left side of the brain. Now, as that is dying, we'll struggle and you'll find people struggle to find words. For example, nouns go very, very quickly. And you'll hear them say, oh, do you know the thing that I put? Don't you know that thing that I put in, in that? Nouns is very important. And it's one of the things that's first to go. They may be able, on the other hand, to have a nice social chit chat because that is what's represented on the, the, the right side of the brain and apparently in dementia that is preserved. And one of the important things that we need to remember in dementia is that though some parts of the brain are lost and are gradually being lost, there is, there is always something being preserved. And the right side of the brain that has that ability to have social chit chat is still very useful and we should make use of it. So sisters, so-and-so, mother, so-and-so might see you in church. And for that split half a minute or one minute, you might have a good, pleasant conversation with her. And you might think all is well. But if you were to be with her for the day, it's a different story because she's not able to have that deep, meaningful conversation. The other thing that happens is things like rhythms are stored in that right side of the brain. And so memorizing songs and prayers and those things are preserved in a lot of cases. So, so somebody might not be able to have that deep, meaningful conversation. They can't even string a sentence together sometimes, but they can remember the three verses of amazing grace that has been stored there and, and that's there because of the rhythm and they're able to pray. And so we should make use of those things that are preserved. The other thing that happens on the right side of the brain is that we tend to store forbidden words there. And so as the left side deteriorates and we are less able to find words to describe uh, certain things, we might get an emotion where we're upset, for example, and a word comes in our mind because even though we're Christians, we live in this world and we've been socialized into using words that are forbidden. We hear them, we might not use them, but it doesn't mean we don't know them. We put them away in the back of our brain on the right side, apparently. And as we get 
older, or sorry, and as dementia sets in, the ability to, to use another, your left side of your brain to choose a word that is more appropriate in, in an emotional response is lost. So dear old mother so-and-so, who is a Holy Ghost Hill sister, might suddenly say words that you think, oh my God, where did that come from? That's because the, 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 she's losing the, her, her language ability or communication ability on the left side and the right side. When it happens, her left or front, uh, frontal lobe is again not working. She's not able to reason and think before she acts and she just says something that comes and you think, why is mom doing this? What's happening? It distresses you. But you know, that's just part of the disease and it's worth being aware of that. The other thing, the other part of the lobe that we quickly need to talk about is the occipital lobe. If you, if you put your hand at the back of your head, that's the occipital lobe that has to do with vision. Vision is very, very important for our functioning. If we can't see, it's a big thing. As dementia sets in, instead of having a wide uh, view, a wide field of vision with good peripheral vision, because even if you're looking forward, you might be able to see your fingers moving. Their vision is narrowed like that. And it is just seeing a very small area, a very small field of vision. In addition, sometimes the brain gets to a state where it can't deal with both eyes functioning. And so we get monocular vision setting in. And so they're not able to see the things that you can see. So that combined with the fact that they can't remember means that they get very fearful, they're agitated, they don't want you to move things, they walk around with things stuffed in their pockets, they carry on everything because they're fearful that they'll remember, they won't be able to remember and they can't see. And you might come up to you, person with you know, dementia and say, the front of your clothes is messed up, you need to change it. And they can't see that. And so you might get in an argument with that person. But if you are aware that their vision and their memory and all of these things are impacted, then you will understand and find strategy to deal with certain things, including the fact that they don't remember they haven't had a bath and they're wearing dirty clothes maybe for three days and you can't get them to change it. Those are strategies that we have to find to deal with certain things, but it's all because of what is happening in the brain. And it's worth remembering that by the time somebody dies from dementia, their brain might be one third the size of the, the original size of their brain. So the brain shrinks, but we can't see it. The skull size looks the same, but the, the, the size of the brain is significantly less. And that's one of the troubles in dementia. So I just want just to, to say a few things with regards to the fact that all of this is happening. The goal for us, it behoves us to understand that this part of the brains are being lost and it's being lost gradually. But there are some things that are kept, some things that are preserved, and we should use those. We have to respect what is missing whilst using what still remains and understanding that more and more will be lost as the disease progresses. Memory, not everything is lost, but the initial, the, the recent memory is lost and gradually things will be lost. So the older person with the dementia might suddenly, they've lost so many years gradually as they go back. And at one point they may be asking, where is this place, their house? This is not my home. This is not where I live because they've lost many years and they probably are at the stage when they are 20 years old or later in their, you know, er, late 20s, early 30s, when they've got you, maybe the, 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 the son or the daughter who is looking after them, a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old. What they are remembering is you at two years old, six years old. So you might walk in the room and they're asking, who are you? And that can be very upsetting, but being aware of that and finding strategies to deal with that will help to manage the condition. And the ability to speak is you know, important. And again, as I mentioned, dealing with, brains, uh, dealing with all of that is very, very important. So, 
I'm going to move on to the next slides and it's going to be a whistle stop tour through the rest of these slides because I wanted to lay that foundation about the function of the brain and how it affects dementia. So Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, is the most common type of dementia. And on this slide, all I'll say is, if you look at a slice of the brain, so these are done when people die and autopsy is done. And that's how we have most of the information that we have about dementia, because you can't really do a biopsy of the brain. We might take a biopsy of the skin, for example, but you're not going to biopsy somebody's brain just to look. So it's mostly when people have died and autopsies are done that you're able to study the brain. And if you look, this is a nice, healthy slice of brain. But look at the very different here. A lot of the brain tissue is lost. The, these areas are widened. This part here is widened. Look at this part. The hippocampus down here, all of this is lost. And this is probably two thirds the size of this, but it will get even smaller. And so just going over here, nice healthy brain. But by the time it gets to late stage of the disease, this is just really, really very, very small. Dementia risk causes, risk factors and causes. There are risk factors are things that make you more likely to get a disease, but it's not what will necessarily cause the disease. So as you get older, you're more likely to get uh, dementia. Age is a natural risk factor. Uh, somebody in their 90s, to a couple in their 90s, more than likely one of them, if not both, will have dementia. There is something called mild cognitive impairment. It's like it can be a stage before dementia. You know, when you have that memory loss and a few other things, but it's not impacting your day-to-day -day ability. We call that MCI or mild cognitive impairment. A lot of people live with that. It's not quite dementia, but it may transition onto dementia. That makes you at increased risk. And a lot of other things, diseases like cardiovascular diseases, if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stroke, if you've got Parkinson's disease, if you've got hypertension, diabetes, depression, all of those diseases increase your risk of getting dementia. I'm not telling us these for us to fret and worry. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But when you've got knowledge, you use the information to empower yourself. So what can we do about this? Think about lifestyle things. We won't have time to go through them, but just to mention alcohol increase. And, and lots of other things are risk factors. Causes all the types of dementia that I mentioned. Um, sometimes some tumors, it's quite rare, but that can cause dementia. In terms of diagnosing dementia, as I mentioned, it can be quite challenging to do so. You don't just go into the GP surgery and you tell them, um, this, my mother is had, having a bit of memory problems and I'm concerned and the diagnosis is made. There has to be a good full history taking. Then there has to be uh, assessments using certain tools, clinical tools that we use. And then there will have to be, um, the history will be eliciting whether there are certain causes, um, clinical features. And if it is suspected, you may be referred to a specialist. And from there, you may go to like the memory clinic. And other important tests will be done. The GP may do some tests even before referring you. They'll look for thyroid function, anemia. A lot of tests uh, can be done to just make sure that this is not an abnormality in the blood, a physical cause that's mimicking dementia. But if, you're, if it is suspected, you will be referred. And when all of this is done, the CT scan, the, you, you know, the, all this, the important scans then the, the and you have ruled out all the things that it is likely to be then the disease the diagnosis will be made these are just features of dementia i will leave this slide because i think sandra is going to cover some of these but just remember the cognitive impairment the behavioral and psychological and um, symptoms the difficulties with activities of day-to-day -day living and the fact that the different types of disease will present in different way. Memory is a key thing. And this slide, um, we could have a whole session on memory, but just remember it is a key part, but it is not the only thing. And initially it's recent events that will be lost, short-term memory, but eventually even long-term memory will be lost. 
I have talked about assessing and the tests that can be done. Some of the things that we need to make sure it isn't before we made the diagnosis would be, you know, things like normal aging, depression, delirium. Delirium usually happens when your loved one gets admitted to hospital, maybe with an infection or the new environment and they get confused. It's not necessarily dementia at this stage. It is something called delirium, which is reversible. Management of dementia is very complex and includes a lot of things. Once it's sus suspected, there are certain things that are done, like I mentioned, the referral. One of the things that has to be talked about is the person's ability to drive. And you don't just say to them, okay, come on, mom, come on, dad, give me the keys. You're not driving anymore. It has to be a discussion and it has to be approached in a, in a certain way for it to, you know, that to be effective. Because think of it, if you're losing your driving license, it's not a, a small thing. It's taking a lot of your independence away. It is mandatory in England to report somebody with dementia to DVLA. The person may still be able to drive initially, but assessments will be done to make sure that that is safe. They can no longer drive things like any vehicle that carries other people. So a lorry, a bus, those will be off limits totally. One thing I want to mention in management is the management of the carers. Carers, carers, carers. If you are caring for somebody with the, the dementia, you're unfortunately at increased risk of getting dementia yourself. You can get carers burnout. It is a stressful situation. As a healthcare professional working, I've worked in areas with people with dementia. It can be very, very demanding and very stressful. So being aware of that, taking time out and looking after yourself is a key part of the management because you manage the person, but you also need to manage the person looking after the person. And just to mention at the end of dementia, there are certain key things that are important to discuss. End stage things. We don't like to talk about these things as a group of people and as people in the church, but things are just mentioned here that need to be borne in mind and need to be discussed with your GP or the consultant who is looking after your loved one before it's too late. Is things like end of life management. If possible, plan ahead, have an advanced care plan. How does this person want to die? Do you want to stay at home? Do you want to go to a, 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 a care home facility or you need to make a will? Who are you gonna appoint as your lasting power of attorney? Planning about what will happen with eating and drinking. Are you gonna request for a tube to be put in to, fed, to be fed, for them to be fed when the brainstem function declines and they can no longer swallow? Are you gonna ask? For them to go peacefully. All of these things need to be taken into consideration. And if you go into hospital and you find that these decisions are made without your input, speak to the doctors, speak to the nurses. Don't go guns, you know, going guns blazing, but have a discussion because it's worth doing. And it's worth doing, like I said, at an earlier than a later stage when the person can be involved as much as possible. And then the whole thing of if the person's heart stops, do you want the healthcare professionals to resuscitate that person? That decision needs to be made and it is good if it is made beforehand and documented. Medications can help. They don't cure the disease. It might be just the thing that makes the difference between somebody being managed at home and having to go into a care home. And complications occur, but that's it for um, dementia. I won't go through this slide. I will just end with saying, this quote that I found by somebody called Tipa Snow is an expert in dementia. She said, every person living with dementia is doing the best he or she can. Their brain is failing. It is not their responsibility to change, to make all lives better. Rather, it's our responsibility to change, to make their lives better. And I'll end at this point. God bless you. God bless you, Sister Carol. Thank you very much for such an excellent, excellent presentation. I'm just now gonna share my screen. Okay.
Okay, is everybody able to see the screen at the moment? Yes, yes you can see it. Excellent. Okay. You want to make it bigger with the slideshow? Okay. That's okay. Yes. So my first screen uh, just tells us that um, it really is important to uh, see the GP, as Dr. Carroll has pointed out, really important. Um, Luke was a physician in the Bible, and so we don't have to worry. There's no stigma about going to see the GP. Um, we should also speak to the Lord as well and ask the Lord in prayer, what's the best thing that we should do if we're experiencing symptoms Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean on to our own, not lean on to our own understanding. In all our ways, we should acknowledge God. So we should always remember to speak to the Lord. And then it's no problem at all to go and see a GP, to see a nurse, to tell them I'm experiencing these symptoms or my family members experiencing them. Also, if we had a broken leg, we would actually go um, to a and &E. So it's not a problem at all. So never ever worry about going to see a GP. Now the symptoms um, that Sister Carol, Dr. Carol spoke about, uh, just to reiterate, difficulty remembering recent events, poor concentration, difficulty recognizing people and objects, poor organizational skills, disorientation, feeling fearful, worried about what's going to happen and what's happening to you at the moment or what's happening to your family member. Today, I'm gonna to really touch on a lot about um, the advice um, assistance that we can offer to carers firstly, and then I'll speak about the person who is actually unwell with dementia. Now, the carers may be feeling alone. They may feel grief because this person who they knew is not the same person. And as Dr. Carroll has said, they're losing their memory, and they're losing their language, they're losing communication skills. So the person who's caring for them feels stressed out. You may feel frustrated, you may feel fear, you may feel really, really down and worried and anxious about what's going on. We are here to remind you that the word of God in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, as Dr. Carroll said, is that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Lamentations 3, verse 23, 22 to 23 tells us that the mercies of God are true. They are real. And his faithfulness is great every morning. There are people that you can go to to speak to. There are confidential contacts in the church. They are counsellors. They are bound by confidentiality. We have um, lots of counsellors in the Bristol district, and we were told about them when we went through two years of COVID. I think you, you may remember we were given numbers. But if you can't remember anything and you're very, very worried about um, just feeling stressed out and worried, you can go and see your pastor. There must be someone in your church that you can speak to. They could be an usher, a deacon, or you may be a nurse or a doctor. And nurses and doctors are bound by confidentiality. So anything that you tell us, like for example, I'm bound by uh, practice, which is the NMC, Dr. Carrie's bound by the GMC. And so therefore anything that you come to us and speak to us about, we have to keep credential. In our church in Wellington, we had coffee mornings and we found that these were really useful in places that people could come and just sit walk to each other about anything that they were very, very worried about. Uh, lots of other support as well. Um, there are memory aids that you can use in your churches and you can use them at home as well. You can make your cupboards transparent because when the person goes into the kitchen, they really can't remember, why did I go into the kitchen? What did I go in there for? And so that's a really good tip um, that you can come across. And just to go back to the carers as well, sometimes when the person comes to you and they're very, very agitated, they may even push you, they may be abusive, as Dr. Carol has pointed out, they can't find the word that they need, they may become aggressive. If this happens, try and remember to count to 10. I know it's not easy, 
but try and count to 10. Have a deep breath. So let's just practice having a deep breath now. Breathe in through the nose. Fill the lungs up. Breathe out through the mouth. Immediately you start feeling calmer. Can you feel that, everybody? Let's do it again. Breathe in through the nose. Out through the mouth. Immediately you're feeling so much calm. And sometimes when someone comes and they hit you or they push you, you might immediately, your, your reaction is to turn around and what's going on and you're trying, you know, you may sort of get angry. But um, a bishop, um, Bishop Simmons once said to me, um, let your words be sweet because you may have to eat them. So it's really important. And my dad also said to me, um, he also said as I was growing up, he said, you can't fight fire with fire. It's best to get loads of buckets of cold water and pour onto the fire and that will calm things down. So it's, it's not easy being a carer, but if you remember to have some patience and think calmly and do everything really, really sort of slowly, then it will help you, I promise you. The person with dementia needs, needs lots of support. As I was saying about the memory aids, you can leave... Um, certain notices, um, notes around the church. You can put a note on the cupboard and say, this is a knife and draw a knife cupboard. This is where we keep the cops. As I said before, you can make them transparent. You can help people with, with you know, if there's anyone in your church that you feel has is unwell with this, you can offer support by going around to their houses, doing the shopping, laying the table, gardening, taking the dog for a walk if they've got pets. Lighting is very, very important in our churches and in our homes. It reduces the risk of falls. Dr. Carroll mentioned that it is mainly the elderly population that will be unwell with dementia. And so therefore, they sometimes have sight blindedness, so they cannot see very well and they may not be able to hear very well. And so it really is important that they go for hearing tests and they go for sight tests as well. It's important to keep the curtains open at home if you can during the day. Try and make sure that nothing blocks the windows so that they can see like unnecessary blinds, unnecessary nets. It's very important that they are able to see properly. In our BCC centre, we've got automatic sensors as we walk into the bathroom. Sometimes at home we haven't got that. And you'll see the person touching the wall, wondering what's, where's the light switch? So, you know, things like that are very, very important. Reducing the noise is really important also. person with dementia may not be able to hear properly. They may be wearing a hearing aid. And then if you come up to them, um, you're walking on a floor that is very, very noisy and you come up to them behind them, they might be quite shocked and worried about what's going on. In our churches, we are blessed because we have a lots of carpets and cushions and carpets and cushions, they absorb noise. So it's really excellent that we do have that. But if you haven't got that in your home, just try and remember that laminate flooring can be quite noisy when you're walking on it behind the person who has dementia. Try to avoid rugs that are on the floor because with rugs, when the person looks down, they may be worried and wondering, what is that? It could look like water to them and they're trying to step over it and they could actually fall over. Mirrors as well, reflections can be very, very troubling because the person will look at themselves in the mirror and they may not be able to understand who that person is because they can't remember who they are. And so if you're in your own home and you can cover up the mirror, that's fine. You can't do that sometimes in a communal building, but that's just for us to remember. Other ways to help is that the person may repeat themselves a lot, but try to have some patience. Speak very clearly and slowly to them. Give them time to respond. Don't give them too many choices at once. Would you like a cup of tea, Mom? Not would you like a cup of tea, coffee, milk, sugar? Because that person is now becoming confused and worried and wondering what you're saying. 
They may become restless and fidgety. They may be walking, wandering around the church or wandering around the home. Please don't worry about that because this is because they are feeling unwell. They are wondering where they are. And so therefore you can go up to them quietly and just speak to them lovingly. And remember, please don't shout to them. <laughs> they may be having um, delusions, unusual beliefs that are based on, re on, on reality. So please just be calm and patient and speak really lovingly to them. They may be having hallucinations. They may hear or see things that don't exist. And so it's just for us, just to remind them where they are, put them back in the here and now, okay? And then there are other things that we can help them with. And it's a memory box. Now to make a memory box, all you've got to do is just, you go to the shop, you buy a pair of shoes, you've got a box right there. You can make it nice and pretty, make it look lovely. The things that we put in the memory box will be letters, cards, postcards, any pictures that will remind that person of a long time ago when they were possibly growing up. Um, there could be pictures of uh, like a postcard from Christmas that they really did love. And it could be a picture of one of their children. Memory boxes are great for helping with communication. You can use them at the church or you can use, you have to ask your pastor first, of course, and the person's consent. You can use them in the home as well. They really help to sharpen up the, the long-term memory because the present memory, as Dr. Carroll said, is probably not there anymore or it's vacant. And so therefore the memory box will really help them. And you can go up to them, sit with them, take a, take a picture out, take a postcard and you can talk about that and that will help with the communication with that person. I'm happy to answer questions about the memory box afterwards as well. Okay. Now, the fruit of the spirit is really, really important. There are nine segments. There's one fruit, the joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It all comes from love. We are supposed to love each other. And so therefore, everything that we do with this person should be done in love. We're supposed to speak to them gently, speak to them in meekness, be kind to them, be friendly. Because you know what? I was taught many years ago in nursing, approximately 30 years ago, that we are supposed to be empathetic people, very, very calm and friendly and loving people. So just some words from the Bible of encouragement. As I said before, we've not been given the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. We don't want to claim these illnesses. However, if they occur, we have Jesus who we can go to. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7, it declares that we should cast all our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. In Matthew, it tells us that we should speak positive things about ourselves because as a man thinketh, so is he. Thus, in concluding, Philippians 4 verse 8 tells us, reminds us, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, and of a good report, let's think on these things. The references I use today are from the Word of God, the NICE Guidelines, Dementia UK, Alzheimer's Society, and NHS Choices. You can go on any of those websites and, of course, to the Bible to help you. And I'm here as an usher of the church in Wellington. And I'm, I'm happy to give you some more advice should you need it. Thank you very much for taking your precious time out today to listen to myself and Dr. Carol, God bless you, and I hope your family stays well. Thank you very much, Sister Sandra. We've got about two, three, maybe five minutes for Q and A. If anybody has any questions, you can either raise your hand, unmute yourself, and ask, or you could type it in the chat. 
God bless you, everyone. Uh, great work to Dr. Carol and to Sister Sandra. This is Daniel Simmons here. Um, I just wanted to know, how do you offer support or what ways are there that you can offer support to carers who, you know, will be looking after um, those suffering with, with dementia or Alzheimer's? What I would say is, um, I, will, I will start the answer and I'm sure Dr. Carol will continue. I would say, uh, first of all, if you visit your GP, your GP will give you advice as practice nurses who work at the GP surgery as well. And we are taught, uh, I'm doing a course on practice nursing and we are taught that before a person leaves the surgery, that we must give them advice and we can send it to their phone. So we will be sending you links to Dementia UK and to the Alzheimer's Society as well. And obviously um, I spoke about the Bible as well. So there's words in the Bible that can help you as well, but there are ushers in the church. There are nurses and doctors around the church that can give you advice. Over to Dr. Carol. Thank you, Sister Sandra. You mentioned the Alzheimer's Society and they do some practical things because obviously they are experts in that area. And even as a GP, as you all know, it's very difficult to see your GP. That's the reality. Um, and we have 10 minutes <laughs> to see each people. <laughs> so we sometimes might not be able to spend that time, but we can signpost you. And that would be the main thing. So somewhere like the Alzheimer's Society has courses for professionals and for carers. I've not accessed them, so I don't know the quality, but they are experts and it's a very good um, uh, society. They've got a video, for example, this morning I found it and watched it, something called... Um, a video called Finding Patience. And it's about a black woman who developed dementia and how her family coped. And so that is one resource that I know is available and is specifically catered to our ethnic group, for, for example. But the Alzheimer's Society is a very good, very good um, society that can give practical help. The other person that I, the other resource that I found online is somebody called Tipa Snow. She's an American dementia expert. She's very good. I've downloaded one of her books that she's written um, about dementia in the surgery. It's in my, my, my presentation references, but she's got together with, uh, with a, a priest, a clergyman, and they've written a book about how to practically help individuals in their churches. So that would be a very good resource as well. Also, yeah, I'd like to also um, recommend Admiral, there, there's a thing called, um, on the website of the um, Dementia UK, there's also Admiral Nurses as well. I don't know if you've heard of that, Dr. Carol, but they're called Admiral Nurses and you can find them online as well. Okay. And I mean, if somebody is in a care home, for example, the, the carer should have specialist treatment and um, training, should have specialized um, training. And for you as carers, like I said, to get training, you could approach the Alzheimer's Society. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Brother Daniel, for that. I, can I just say, I've just looked in the chat and I just want to say thank you everyone for encouraging myself and Dr. Carol. Um, we really, really appreciate it. I've just had a, a quick look and thank you so much for, yes. for taking your time out to listen today. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I definitely echo that. And yes, I'm having a look as well. And yes, there are some excellent comments. Thank you so much. And I hope that... Um, you have benefited. I hope, like we said, we have empowered you and that the element of fear would be less, if not totally reduced. There is help and we're here. You can have my slides for reference if you would like to have that, just um, inform the Bethel Central team. I'm happy to send those across as much as if you do require them. I think we'll be asked to Go back into the room. Okay, we probably have a few more minutes. 11.42, 11.45.
to move back. It's now 11.42. So if anybody else has any other comments or questions, we can take another question and then we can start moving back into the main hall. Okay, so some of the things that I just mentioned that some of the things that I didn't get to cover is the specialist, uh, for example, once you're referred, there were, you know, a few years ago, it was just maybe CT scan or MRI scan that, that would be done. But now they've got, we've got more, more advanced scans, for example, a PET scan can kind of light up the, the area of the brain that is that is being affected when they show certain images as well. So what I'm saying is that there are more tests that can be done with a view to diagnose the type of dementia, because like I said, that helps a lot. For example, somebody with Lewy body dementia will present a lot like somebody with Parkinson's disease, and they'll have like very vivid hallucinations like Sister Sandra mentioned. So they'll talk about the cat in the house or that strange child or this red man or this blue man that they're seeing. But if you're aware that they've got that type of dementia, you'll be able to talk to them. Don't say, oh, there's no cat, for example, mm. or there's no child. You'll acknowledge what they're saying and have a talk about it. So what does that make you feel? Does it make you feel scared, for example? Or, you know, and just talk about it. And maybe you'll just distract them. Or if it persists, don't, the, the point is don't argue about it because to them, it is real. They might fight in their sleep because they're having these vivid dreams. And it's being aware that that is the case. You know, again, finding strategies to deal with, with these cases. Like I said, that book, um, is useful and the Alzheimer's Society is able to provide training for you. But you must remember as a carer, you know, to take time out and to deliberately and actively look after yourself because it can be very, very stressful. And it, it is a case of, there was a time when you, your, your, your older, you know, your mother or your father were making their own decisions. And initially that will continue. You will allow them to make decisions as much as possible and support them. But there comes a time when you have to be making the decisions for them. And that's difficult, especially if you know, you've got your parent who's been you know, independent. And so it can be quite paradoxical. Having but just, yeah, just to echo, just to say that don't take anything personally because they don't mean it, they're not well. So it's just a reminder everyone not to take anything personal um, and count to 10 and breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth <laughs> many times. Okay. Thanks again, everybody. I think we can start moving back to the main room. Okay. All right. Well, God bless everyone. Yeah. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Sister Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lorna. God, God bless. bless. God bless. Yeah. Bless you, Brother Daniel. Thank you so God much for your support. You, that was wonderful. God uh, bless you, Mother Bell. God, God bless you. We God love bless you. <laughs> God bless you, Sister Angie, Sister Shirley. God bless you all. Yes, God bless you folks. Okay. Really appreciate it. I know. You appreciate it. We would really love for you to do this in the convocation in August, but I mean, yeah. would be great yeah. to scale, you know, for... Mm. I totally so agree that. Our, our bishop, yeah. I don't know if our bishop is still here, but to include that, we put that to them and um, that request. But yes, it's very important information. Yeah. Right, so we're being asked to leave the room now, so let's go back in the main room. Thank okay, you. Okay, then. God bless you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 God bless you. Enjoy Bye, the rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you.